Today we have this absolutely ridiculous integral. It's the integral from 0 to 1 of the natural logarithm of gamma x times the square of the cosine of pi times x. So yeah, that really is something. And I'd like to start off with the transformation of taking x to the 1 minus x realm. That gives me i equal to the integral from 1 to 0 now of the natural logarithm of gamma 1 minus x times the square of the cosine of pi minus pi times x. And the differential element here turns into negative dx. But of course, we can get rid of the negative sign by switching up the limits of integration. So we again have this integral from 0 to 1. Now, the cosine of pi minus x equals negative cosine x. But here we have the square of the cosine, so we retain the positive sign, which implies that i equals the integral from 0 to 1 of log gamma 1 minus x times the square of the cosine of pi x dx. And the motivation behind this transformation of x to 1 minus x is now we have this log gamma x term up here and this log gamma 1 minus x term down here. So if we combine the two integrals, we'll get a really nice structure. So adding up the two forms for i, we have 2i equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of factoring out this cosine square pi x term. We have log gamma x terribly sorry about that, plus log gamma 1 minus x integration with respect to x. And using the properties of the logarithm, we can write this as the integral from 0 to 1 of cosine square pi x times the logarithm of gamma x times gamma 1 minus x. And we can now apply Euler's beautiful reflection formula and I'm also going to expand by one half, so we're left with i on the left-hand side. Okay, cool. So recall the gamma x times gamma 1 minus x equals pi divided by the sine of pi x, which implies that i equals one half the integral from 0 to 1 of cosine square pi x times the logarithm of pi divided by sine pi x integration with respect to x. Now for substitution, we're gonna let pi times x equal u, which implies that dx equals one by pi du. And this further implies that i equals one by two pi times the integral from now as x approaches zero, we have u approaching zero, and as x approaches one, we have u approaching pi. So it's the integral from zero to pi of cosine square u times the logarithm of pi divided by sine u du. Now using the properties of the logarithm, we can write this as one by two pi times the integral from zero to pi of cosine square u times the logarithm of pi, which is just a constant. So let me just write that out here, much better. And we have this other integral, minus the integral from zero to pi of cosine square u times the logarithm of sine u. Now, the first integral here is pretty simple. We'll solve it using the double angle formula. So we know that cosine square u, terribly sorry about that, equals one half of one plus cosine two u. So integrating the whole thing from zero to pi means that we have one half times u plus sine two u divided by two with the limits being zero and pi. Now, as u approaches pi, we have pi plus sine of two pi, which is zero, minus zero minus sine of zero is zero. So the whole thing just sorts out to one half of pi, which means that the integral i equals one by two pi times pi by two log 
pi minus this integral from zero to pi of cosine square u times the logarithm of sine u du. And we're gonna call this integral i sub one, and that's our next target. Now for the integral i sub one, we have this log sine u term. And we see that for the curve y equals sine of u, we have this really nice symmetry around the line u equals pi by two. So because of this symmetry, we could just consider the interval from zero to pi by two and double the result. This is also backed up by the cosine function, where although we don't have exactly the same symmetry, but we do see that we have equal areas below and above the x-axis. And for the square of the cosine, we would have both areas above the x-axis equal with respect to the line u equal to pi by two. Okay, cool, so that means we could just consider the integral from zero to pi by two and double the result. And now what? Well, I could expand the cosine square function here as one minus the squared sine function, so I have one minus sine square u times the logarithm of sine u du. And using the linearity of the integration operator, I have twice the integral from zero to pi, rather two times the integral from zero to pi by two of log sine u du, terribly sorry about that, much better, minus the integral from zero to pi by two of sine square u times the logarithm of sine u du. Now the first of these integrals is one of Euler's log trig integrals that sorts out to pi by two, negative pi by two times log two, that is. So we have negative pi log two minus twice the integral from zero to pi by two of sine square u times the logarithm of sine u integration with respect to u. Now for one more substitution, we're gonna let sine u equal t and my handwriting seems a bit more off than usual today. I mean, even I'm noticing that. Anyway, so we're gonna let sine u equal t, and this implies that cosine u du equals dt. But we don't have any cosine u terms, so I'm just gonna write this as du equal to dt divided by cosine u, and we can express cosine in terms of the sine function as square root one minus sine square u, sine square u being t squared, so that's our differential element. And as u approaches zero, we have t approaching zero, and as u approaches pi by two, we have t approaching one. Okay, so that means i sub one equals negative pi times log two, and we have this negative two times the integral from zero to one. Uh, the square of the sine of u is now t squared and we had log sine u, so that's log t divided by square root one minus t squared dt. And now for this integral that looks sort of intimidating, we're actually just gonna use integration by parts where we're gonna be integrating the t squared divided by one minus t squared square root of one minus t squared uh, term that is. You get what I'm trying to say. Anyway, so this is a pretty interesting antiderivative here. It's the sort of thing I really don't come across much these days. This problem is quite interesting in that respect as well that I actually do need a nice or unusual sort of antiderivative, not that unusual, but at least it looked that way for me at this point. So what I did here is introduce a couple of negative signs, and now I want to introduce a zero. So I have one minus one here. So I have the integral of one minus t squared divided by root one minus t squared dt minus the integral. I was gonna add the limits there. <laughs> okay, so we have dt divided by root one minus t squared, which is cool. 
but wait a minute. I can write this as, oops, positive sign over there. I can write this as integral, negative integral of root one minus t squared dt plus this integral, which is of course just the inverse sine of t. And now for this integral, again, I'm gonna use integration by parts. So that would give me t times root one minus t squared, negative sine, of course, two negatives canceling out, integral t divided by root one minus t squared times two, and I have this negative two t term here as well. The twos cancel out quite nicely. I have this inverse sine of t function. And so on the left-hand side, I have the integral of t squared divided by root one minus t squared dt. And on the right, I have inverse sine t minus t times root one minus t squared. And I also have the negative of the integral of t squared dt divided by root one minus t squared. And that only means one thing, that the integral of t squared dt divided by root one minus t squared equals one half of inverse sine t minus t times root one minus t squared. So now that we have this nice antiderivative, we'll return to the problem of i sub one and I just noticed that I was about to use this color, but then I stopped. And I recall using this color quite a bit back in the day, especially when I used to make these videos on my phone. So let's add it back to the mix. So we have i sub one equal to negative pi times log two minus twice. Well, we have log t divided by two times inverse sine t plus t times root one minus t squared with the limits being zero and one. And in these limits, the entire term will just collapse to zero. So that's quite convenient. And we have minus one half times the integral from zero to one of inverse sine t the derivative of log t being the reciprocal of t minus t times root one minus t squared divided by t, where again the t's cancel out and we're left with root one minus t squared integration with respect to t. Now we have i sub one equal to negative pi times log two minus two times, so we have negative one half here we can cancel that out and just write this with a plus sign. We're interested now in the integral from zero to one of inverse sine t divided by t dt minus, no, plus the integral from zero to one of root one minus t squared dt. Now, this integral here is left as an exercise to the viewer. It's a rather simple integral and as a hint, all you need is some integration by parts and a nice substitution afterwards. You'll get a very familiar result. And that result is of course the, uh, okay, so we have pi by two times log two. That should be enough of a hint as to what exactly you're gonna expect from the solution development for this integral. And this integral here is just a quarter of the area of the unit circle. So that's gonna be pi by four. Okay, cool. So we have negative pi log two plus pi by two times log two. So this implies that I sub one equals negative pi by two times log two plus pi by four. So we finally have the result for I sub one and all that's left is to plug it into the equation for the target integral I and we'll have the final result. But before I do that, notice that I've made a sign mistake up here, where I had two negative signs, but this negative sign outside means that there's gonna be a negative sign here and a negative sign there as well. 
Okay, cool. So we have one by two pi times pi by two times log pi. The two negatives canceling out. So we have pi by two times log two plus pi by four. And now would be a good time to like and subscribe and also drop me a follow on Instagram. Link in the description below. So we have finally we can combine these two log terms as pi by two times log two pi. And because of the one by two pi outside, we're gonna be left with a quarter of log two pi plus one by eight. And that's the final result, which is pretty cool for our absolute beast of an integral. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you, see you next time.